Good morning. My name is Ryan Wasser. Today I'm going to be talking to you, to, uh, talking to you today about Nietzsche's On the Genealogy of Morals. Uh, a little bit about myself before I begin. I'm a Westchester graduate. I received my undergraduate and graduate degrees in English studies from Westchester. I received my master's in 2019. And I'm a returning graduate student, getting, and I'm going to be getting my second master's in philosophy here in May. Now, the way these lectures are going to go is I'm going to break this into two smaller lectures. Uh, the first is going to cover the preface to Nietzsche's On the Genealogy of Morals, as well as Essay 1. And the second lecture is going to cover a little bit of Essay 2, primarily Essay 3. Uh, during the course of the discussion, I'm going to provide you some questions to think about, uh, as well as, since I'm using Edpuzzle, you're going to see on the bottom of the screen little markers, and those are going to be uh, prompts to kind of get your uh, you know, gears going as far as how you should be thinking about this text. Um, so that's the way this is going to work. Now, I typically use uh, the Barnes and Noble's version of on the genealogy of eh, on the genealogy of morals. Um, it's actually a really good translation of the text, but I know you're not using that. I believe you're using the Marino basic writings of existentialism. Uh, so when I'm not using when I'm not covering the preface for SA2, I'll be giving you the page number so you can see the quotes I'm using throughout the text. So what is, the, what is on the genealogy of morals? Well, it's Nietzsche's attempt to excavate terms like good and evil, uh, something he felt was insufficiently done up until that point, even though such terms have been a point of major concern, both theologically and philosophy, philosophically for a long time. Uh, he wrote this in 1887, uh, and... You know, one of the things that he does most frequently throughout his works is he uses philology uh, to kind of uncover truth about terms. And philology is a branch, or excuse me, a method in philosophical studies that looks at the way languages develop and are used through cultures through time. Um, now, as noted, the text is consistent of a is, yeah, consists of a preface. Three essays, and depending on the copy you have, it has extra supplementary readings. Um, the reason I'm going to be going over the preface in Essay 2 briefly in these lectures is to kind of hopefully inspire you to pick up a copy of your own, because this is, this is a very important text. Um, as far as how this text fits in with the rest of Nietzsche's work, it's a lot different than a lot of his other work. With the exception of uh, The Birth of Tragedy, which was his first major work, it, go, it does away with the aphoristic style of writing that Nietzsche uses, and he talks about that at the end of the preface, but to keep it simple, aphorisms are paragraph or se even sentence length little nuggets of wisdom, uh, and he, he packs as much in there as possible. This is a more typical essay-driven uh, text. Now, it also differs from the text that immediately preceded on the genealogy of morals, and that was Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which was prosaic or uh, it was a, a story uh, that is to be read. So, as far as talking at the preface, like I said, I know you don't have that, but it's important to discuss it for a few reasons. The first reason is that it actually gives you the reasoning why Nietzsche is interested in this. He grew up in a religious uh, environment, and it's something that was always talked about. But as I noted, he didn't feel like it was properly discussed. Um, so, on my book, Nietzsche notes something very important, and this is, this is the key. Uh, he, however, who once halts at this problem and learns how to put questions, will experience what I experienced. A new and immense vista unfolds itself before him. A sense of potentiality seizes him like a vertigo. Every species of doubt, mistrust, and fear springs up. The belief in morality, nay, in all morality, totters. Finally, a new, de a new demand voices itself. Let us speak out this new demand. We need a critique of moral values. The value of these values is for the first time to be called into question. That's the second important thing I want to bring up. Call into question. Nietzsche's philosophy, in fact, most of his philosophical project revolves around this and become the basis for what some would later call uh, the theory of suspicion, or as Nietzsche himself calls in Twilight of the Idols, uh, philosophizing with a hammer. Um, basically, the entire way you get at the base of something is to question it relentlessly. Now, that's what you got to keep in mind here. He's perpetually uh, questioning. Okay. Now, the last thing that's really important to understand here is Nietzsche is kind of an artist, 
And the preface showcases that. Uh, in fact, he's, he's well known for being, let's say, arrogant, although not undeservedly so. So at the end of the preface, he says, if this writing be obscure to any individual and jar on his ears, I do not think that is necessarily I am who am to blame. Take, for instance, my Zarathustra. I allow no one to pass muster as knowing that book unless every single word therein has at some time wrought him in a profound wound and at some time exercised on him a profound enchantment. Then, and not till then, can he enjoy the privilege of participating reverently in the Hallison, Hallican, <laughs> I can never say that word, element from which that work is born in its sunny brilliance, its distance, its spaciousness, its certainty. Okay? Um, this is an important concept. What Nietzsche does with these texts, and this is what he does with aphorisms, is he writes uh, with what he calls polysemy, or polysemically, which means each word, each phrase is, can literally be taken in any number of ways. Okay? Um, and Nietzsche knows he writes like this, so he's arrogant about it. Uh, again, in, I believe it is Beyond Good and Evil, he talks about how he can write in a sentence what other people can't write in a book. You know, that's... <laughs> if it was any other author, I'd, uh, I'd be inclined to disagree. So, now we're going to move on to the first essay. Okay? Now, the first essay is where Nietzsche really digs into the genealogy of morals. Uh, like I said, he's really concerned with how good and evil are arrived at. And this leads him, towards the end of the text, to unconceal or uncover what he calls the master-slave morality. But he doesn't start there. He actually starts with a critique of contemporary English psychologists, and in a lot of ways we can uh, tie this in, for those who are interested, with another author called John Stuart Mill. He thinks that the psychologists are too preoccupied with the concept of forgotten utility of morals, you know, what is good. Um, now, he, he says that this is interesting. He calls them interesting because of this. That's because he views them as dangerous, which we'll talk about momentarily. Um, but, yeah, so for utilitarianism, if you have gotten a chance to read Bentham or Mill, the concern is basically finding the most possible good in relation to the least possible bad. So for him to say they are viewing morals as being good and evil, He's saying that it's coming, it's coming out of that. So, the, let's actually talk, talk about that. For Nietzsche, morals aren't an issue of good and evil in the utilitarian sense. They are derived from almost a class structure. And he says that the good is ultimately uh, found first and foremost, uh, finding its footing in the values of the aristocrat. And on page 113, he specifies that. He says, and this is around midway through the text, it was the good themselves, that is to say the noble, powerful, high-stationed, high-minded, who felt and established themselves in their uh, uh, actions as good. He then goes on to kind of point out a specific case. For example, uh, he's using the power to name things. Uh, the lordly right of giving names extends so far that one should allow oneself to conceive the origin of language itself as an expression of power on the part of the rulers. They say, this is this and this. They seal everything in event with every sound and, as it were, take possession of it. So this is important because it, it, it literally talks to the kind of egotistical, and that obviously has a very negative connotation, self-centeredness of the aristocratic uh, values, whereas uh, the opposite side of the stick, what he'll eventually call the priestly or herd mentality, uh, arises when aristocratic values decay. And this herd instinct, this herd value, arises out of uh, both reaction to the aristocratic class and resentment or resentment. So the, the whole next section needs to be taken with a grain of salt, and I kind of omit certain words here because Nietzsche places a lot of the blame for this on the foot of the Jewish people. What he's concerned here with is the priestly class. Um, and priestly functioning is primarily concerned with issues of cleanliness. That's what he says. And for something, to, there's the difference between the good and the not good, tentatively speaking, is whether or not one is clean or not. Now, this is interesting because I think we can see 
similar themes running through even contemporary politics today. You know, both sides of the political divide kind of view themselves as the morally righteous, uh, the morally clean, whereas the other side is the unclean. I'm not going to obviously take sides on this, but um, the point is that this fixation on cleanliness actually, in relation to the aristocratic values, leads to a kind of sharpening and intensification of the opposed value, you know? Um, so, moving forward. So, the question really becomes this. How do the different classes view the issue of the not good. And I say not good specifically here, or bad, uh, because it's important to differentiate between these things. For the master class or the arist knightly aristocrats, you know, they view others, the not good, the bad, with a kind of passive contempt or ambivalent fleeting disdain. You know, again, they're egotistical, they're self-centered, they're not as concerned with the, the social uh, aspect of their behavior. Um, Nietzsche rightfully goes on to call them beasts of prey, or even at one point he calls them the beautiful blonde brutes. Um, so they don't view their, let's say, the, the, the bad as evil, as we'll get into momentarily, they view them with contempt. That enemy is my own. It's almost kind of a weird point of pride for them. Now, on the other side of the issue, you have the priestly types. You have the slave morality. And this caste of society actually views their enemies as evil, you know? Um, they're, they're concerned in a prudent way with the state of the world. And on the surface, that's, that's, that, that, that seems like a good thing. But again, they look at those as at the, up in the aristocratic values as being evil. So for them, they have a goal. And the goal, as we'll discuss later on in this essay, is to train out of man the beast of prey. And again, this is done primarily through guilt. Uh, what in essay two we'll talk about is bad conscience and resentment. So, moving on, and I believe this is section 12. Yes. Um, in section 12, Nietzsche discusses what he believes to be intolerable. And this is one of those themes that continues to run throughout his entire body of work. And that is um, what he refers to as the dwarfing and leveling down of humanity by the taming of humanity. Now... This is important. Nietzsche notes that in losing fear of humanity, we've also lost hope in humanity. Yea, the will to be human. This is important. Why is it important that we have a fear of humanity? I want you to think about that moving forward. Okay? If we no longer fear ourselves, what dangers do we stand uh, to impose on ourselves? Okay? Now, Moving into the tail end of essay one, Nietzsche goes on to discuss, well, he basically uses an analogy to describe the two different castes. Again, he's already described the aristocrats as a beast of prey, or as beasts of prey. Um, and he frames them against what he calls the lambs uh, in an analogy that kind of differentiates how we should look at these things. Uh, so if you turn to page 133, he starts off. That lambs dislike great birds of prey does not seem strange. Only it gives no ground for reproaching these birds of prey for bearing off little lambs. And if the lambs say among themselves, these birds of prey are evil, and whoever is least like a bird of prey, but rather its opposite, a lamb, would he not be good? Hmm. Okay. Then he goes on to say, there's no reason to find fault with this institution of an ideal, except perhaps that the birds of prey might view it, a little ironically, and say, we don't dislike them at all, these good little lambs. We even love them. Nothing is more tasty than a tender lamb. Nietzsche then goes on to say that popular morality separates strength from expressions of strength, as if it were a neutral substratum behind the strong man. 
which is free to express strength, or not to do so. But there is no such substratum. There is no being behind doing, affecting, becoming. The doer is merely a fiction added to the deed. The deed is everything. I want you to think about what that means here. Um, I think the metaphor is relatively straightforward, but it's important to kind of tease it out a little bit. What Nietzsche is saying is here is that you can't blame a beast of prey for doing things that a beast of prey does. An eagle eats lambs. That's what it does. That doesn't make it evil any more than, you know, the lamb not being able to do so makes the lamb good. This is an important concept. Okay? Um, this isn't obviously a necessary reading. You might not have done so yet. But Fyodor Dostoevsky, one of Nietzsche's uh, spiritual contemporaries, in fact, literal contemporaries, you know, wrote about this matter. The question we have to ask ourselves is, do we have this kind of innate way to be one or the other way? That's probably a really bad way of phrasing it. Um, if we are an eagle, can we act against our eagle tendencies? Uh, if we are a lamb, can we act against our lamb tendencies? Dostoevsky would argue yes. Um, in fact, he puts forth the proposition that part of being human is the possibility of entertaining the possibility of what he refers to as 2 plus 2 equals 5. I'm not sure Nietzsche would make that argument. Uh, and I want you to consider that moving forward. Does Nietzsche think that we have to be the way we are when we're born? So, moving on to section 14. Uh, Nietzsche finally gets into a discussion of what the generation of morals is. And this is, this is really where he gets into the meat of things. He basically looks at morality, most morality that is, as a kind of compensatory act on the part of the person dictating it. Um, the aristocrats don't really have a morality in the way we kind of look at it. Again, they're egotistical. They kind of act in ways that are um, fleeting and almost animal-like. Whereas the slave morality, they have to compensate for something. They can't act like that. So they argue that it's because they are the way they are, their submissiveness to God, that they act the way they do. Nietzsche uses the example of the person, uh, 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 what are his words here? Uh, oh, yes. Nietzsche uses the example of the person who cannot defend himself. This person has to be forgiving because he doesn't have the means to forgive himself. Now, if we turn to page 136, you can actually see how this plays out. Now, if you didn't really understand this section, I know I did the first time I read it. You didn't realize that Nietzsche was basically constructing a figment of his imagination uh, conversation partner to have this with. And the person that he's speaking to, this figment of his imagination, is kind of echoing up the sentiments of the slave morality. And he points out a couple things and then says he can't bear it. But then he, he listens one more time and he gets the final message. He says that he can hear him saying that we are good men, we good men, we are the just. What they desire they call not retaliation, but the triumph of justice. What they hate is not their enemy. No, they hate injustice. They hate godlessness. What they believe in and hope for is not the hope of revenge, the intoxication of sweet revenge, sweeter than honey, Homer called it, but the victory of God, of the just God over the godless. What there is left for them to love on earth is not their brothers in hatred, but their brothers in love, as they put it, all the good and just on the earth. So what they effectively do in order to justify their morality, is to frame uh, the, the master morality, the aristocratic class, as godless. And they say, well, because they're like this, we're like this, and we're just. Okay? Um, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but for anybody who's interested in reading further, there's a lot to be said here about Nietzsche's relationship with Immanuel Kant. I don't know if you've had any readings on that yet, but Kant had this concept called the categorical imperative. Um, and that mean, and, and one of the major categorical imperatives is that, you know, one should act ethically as an end to itself, not as a means to an end. You know? Um, so Nietzsche and Kant, they actually kind of had this antagonistic relationship, but this might be one of the few areas where I think Nietzsche and Kant agree. I think he finds a problem with the slave morality effectively using 
their relationship with God as a means of justifying their, let's call it weakness. I might not necessarily call it weakness, but Nietzsche certainly does. Okay. Now, the last thing that Nietzsche does in this text is he kind of places this within the context of a real example. Um, he brings up the relationship between Rome and Judea. And this is interesting because, as Nietzsche points out, it doesn't matter how powerful Rome was. You know, he says, one only need consider to whom Rome itself nowadays bows down to, to understand who the victor is in the battle of morality. Now, we're going to see this play out again and again, and we're going to come to a better understanding of it in Essay 3, but I want you to really think about this. How did Judea overcome Rome? How did Rome become the fundamentally Christian, uh, Catholic specifically, uh, state that it is. It wasn't like that before. Well, as we previously noted, the Jews, in this particular instance, used the morality of that, that, that pushed this kind of almost existential guilt on the Romans. You know, you're acting badly by not being forgiving, by not being just towards us. And they use that guilt and that resentment to flip the aristocratic class. And as we'll see in SA3, Nietzsche almost kind of looks at this as a form of sickness. So, okay, that's going to be enough for today. Um, if you look in the section of D2L that we have, I will have a file with some uh, prompts for you guys to consider for your own writing, and also consider some of the questions that I've put down here in the Ed Puzzle link. Until next time, uh, I'll, this is Ryan Wasser.